22, accepting, rejecting the Messiah, and as, uh, as I was praying that, and I've, I've tried to kind of prep you to get you uh, to this point to say that when we, and I've kept saying when we get to this point in chapter 12, we're going to see a, a turning point. Uh, in Matthew chapter 4 uh, to chapter 12, up to this point, uh, Matthew has been laying out, again, Jewish writer to a Jewish audience, constantly saying, showing scripturally that Jesus is the Messiah. We have Jesus claiming to be the Messiah. Not only that, we've got him claiming to be the Son of God. We've got him using the title of Son of Man very often and applying it to himself from Daniel. Again, theologians, liberal theologians today seem to be very confused over this issue of who Jesus was, who he thought he was, and who he said he was. But there was no make, uh, mistake about it in terms of the Jewish leadership of that day. They knew exactly what he was saying, what he was claiming, and that's why they took, wanted to take up stones to kill him on several occasions. Uh, because of these miracles that have been taking place that are now in the thousands in the, what we call the Galilean ministry uh, up there in uh, northern Israel, uh, because of the common people heard him gladly, he's training his 12 guys, getting him, them ready to go out. They've gone out, seen the Lord use them to some capacity. And, uh, and Jesus has now kind of ramped things up in terms of the drama between him and the Jewish leadership represented in this case and many other cases by the Pharisees. Uh, these are the people that were the respected religious leaders. The people looked up to them. It's not to say that they were all bad. And we'll, we'll, we'll make reference to, to one of them certainly uh, in our text this morning, but uh, we would say, not just based on what we would see in the New Testament, but certainly based on what Jewish history says as well, is that this is a very corrupt Jewish leadership. And um, Matthew, again, his material is arranged not chronologically as it happened and laid out, but he arranges it topically and he puts it together and he puts it together for a purpose. And last week we looked at this message of Jesus kind of dealing with the Shabbat or the Sabbath, very big deal, and that was, the, that was kind of the straw that breaks the camel's back with, with these guys in terms of Jesus is attacking what would later become the Mishnah or their oral tradition and, uh, and simply uh, some of the things that took place in the healing on the Sabbath and so forth. So let's take a look at this and we're going to go to the end of the chapter. And, and just the other thing uh, about this is that, you know, in a cursory reading, if you read through this whole thing, as obviously I did several times earlier in the week, it's like, how does all this go together? But, but it all goes together, and that's why we need to uh, make it to verse 50 before we're done. First thing is uh, Jesus is challenged to prove his authority as the Messiah. Verse 22, then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. And of course, this is all leading to this point where Jesus is going to say uh, that um, they have committed an unpardonable sin. And we get, if uh, you listen to very many Bible answer type shows and that kind of a thing, they probably get this question once a week. People are very concerned. Have I committed the unpardonable sin? Well, this is the, the text and the context uh, for it. Uh, the first thing we note about this challenge to his authority is that uh, it had to do with a particular demon-possessed man that was brought to him who was blind and, and could not speak. Now, again, they are trying to bring to him 
uh, and force him to either be able to do a miracle or not do a miracle that in a sense was a fulfillment of Scripture and a miracle that only the Messiah could do. Uh, Isaiah uh, 35, 5 is kind of the, the biblical reference. There, Isaiah talking about the Messiah, he will be able to do these things. Then when the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped, uh, then the lame will uh, leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for, for joy. So certainly, Jesus is fulfilling this in front of them. This is a challenge. This is a setup. This is a test. The Pharisees are there. The, you know, there's a, the last thing we went through is they went out and plotted how they would kill him. And, and they even went with the, we know from Luke's gospel, with the Herodians who were sold out to the Romans. So these are two, two, two groups of people that hate each other's guts, but now they're joined together for one purpose, how they can kill uh, Jesus. Because he's claiming to be the Messiah, the people seem to be accepting and rallying around him. Uh, not only that, he's claiming to be God come in the flesh. And, uh, and this is all about their power uh, and holding on to their position uh, in Israel and so forth. Uh, along with a, a great deal of their wealth. Now, the other, so Jesus is fulfilling scripture, but the other thing you got to know is that according to the rabbinical teaching of that day, because of the way they did exorcism, uh, only the Messiah would be able to cast out this kind of a, a demon. If the person could not hear, again, the way, and we see it in the book of Acts, the way that demon possession was done, their exorcists, rabbis and other Jewish exorcists that they had, that had success, Jesus is going to make reference to them in this text, they would engage the person in conversation, find the name of the demon, cast out the demon. And, uh, and we see Jesus do that on an occasion uh, ourselves that we've already gone through in terms of the man up in Gadaris, and, and, and there identify the demons as legions and so forth. So not that it's biblical, but the rabbinical teaching of the day said, if, if, you've, if you had somebody that couldn't speak or couldn't hear then only the Messiah would be able to cast out that demon. So this is a particular <laughs> demon-possessed man that they found and now brought him to Jesus to kind of prove this issue once and for all, of course, in their minds, that he's not the Messiah. But, uh, of course, we realize that he, cast, he does cast the demon out, so they have a problem. There's a question uh, that is asked in verse uh, 23, uh, very important, it's the response of the people. They say, all the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? Again, son of David is just a reference to the Messiah. Could this be the Messiah? That's what the people are asking. The question is, who are they asking? They're asking the Pharisees. Again, the Pharisees are representatives of the Sanhedrin that's come from Jerusalem. And we've kind of identified them and seen them and seen this group uh, leading up to this point. That was their job. Just as it is today, by the way, as we've in our midweek study pointed out at least a few weeks ago that the Sanhedrin began to meet again just a few years ago. They didn't meet for 1,400 years, but they're meeting now. And the reason they came back together in Israel and meet now on a regular basis, the Sanhedrin that we read about in the Bible, is because they believe the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, it will be their job to identify him. It was their job in that day. What they were doing was what they were supposed to be doing. But unfortunately, uh, they judged wrongly. And, and Jesus will point out it was a heart condition with them. So when the people say, is this the Messiah? They're asking the Pharisees, is this the Messiah? Now the, now the Pharisees have to uh, respond to that. So secondly, about this authority, the authority of Jesus is rejected by the Pharisees. And uh, as I mentioned, not all the Pharisees held this view, but certainly those that represented the nation of Israel did. Uh, there was another Pharisee now named Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus said in John 3, 1, uh, again, John writing, now there was a man of the Pharisees uh, named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. And notice what he says, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. You know, Nicodemus comes to the obvious conclusion. You are performing the signs. No one could do these things unless you had come from God. Now, unfortunately, Nicodemus wasn't calling the shots. He was just one guy on this council. But those that were representing the council, therefore representing the, the nation of Israel, they say, 
that's not uh, how he did it at, at all. He's not come from God. No, verse, notice verse 24. When the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Now, <laughs> it's a Hebrew word, Beelzebub, and it simply means the Lord of the flies. It was a god of the, of the uh, Philistines. But to the Jews, it became a name that meant the prince of demons or Satan himself. That's very important to know. Uh, when the people say, is this the Messiah? Well, they, again, they've got two choices. They've got to either admit that he is. Of course, if they do, it's time to get down on your knees because he's the Messiah. Uh, if, uh, if he's not, then they've got to explain how is it that he can do what only the Messiah was supposed to be able to do. And so they come up with this line that he's doing it by the power of Satan himself, uh, which is a, a, a very radical statement. And it's the, it's the turning point. It's the turning point in history of redemption. It's the turning point of the nation of uh, Israel because, again, these guys represent the Sanhedrin that represent the, the nation uh, religiously and spiritually, uh, and they have just rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Is he the Messiah? No. Actually, He's, he's uh, empowered by Satan himself. That was, that was their response. Now, Jesus will give out uh, three arguments to kind of uh, authenticate his ministry in verses 25 to 29. It says, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can rob his house? So argument number one, in verse 25 and 26, is a kingdom divided itself cannot stand. Why would Satan uh, fight against uh, Satan? Uh, Jesus acknowledges that Satan has a kingdom. Uh, he makes reference to the house, his house, uh, at, uh, at this point, uh, and how they're in opposition to him. And why would he turn uh, against, if Jesus was, uh, again, operating under the power of Satan, why would Satan be you know, destroying what he was doing and so forth. So, so he says, what you're seeing is uh, not logical at all. And secondly, he says uh, that uh, uh, he cast out demons by the same authority as their own exorcist. No, none of those Pharisees would, would ever deny that, that the way a Jewish exorcist or, or rabbi could cast out a, team, a demon was by the Spirit of God. In fact, if you could cast out a demon, it proved the Spirit of God was with you. So when, when Jesus says this, he's saying, now, I've just cast out a demon. What does that mean? It means the Spirit of God is with me. Unless you're willing to say that your own exorcists are casting out demons by Beelzebub, then you can't make that, exact, uh, that um, accusation to me because it's, it's contrary to your own theology and, and your own thinking. It was uh, inconsistent with what they would say in, uh, in every other theological discussion. The third argument is that Jesus must have authority over Satan, who is a strong man, uh, that must be bound. If, if Jesus is able to go in and cast out the demons, uh, if he's able to go in and cast out Satan, then Satan must be subservient to him and he must be over him. That's his, uh, his third uh, argument. And then he comes to the conclusion, therefore, if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then I am the Messiah and the kingdom of God has uh, has come. Now, thirdly, then Jesus delivers the ultimate accusation to those who reject him as Messiah, and that's in verses 30 to 37. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit, you brood of vipers. 
How can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you'll be condemned. Now, again, I'm, I'm assuming this is a pretty familiar passage to, uh, to most of us. And, um, and what I'm about to kind of go through with you, it may be absolutely totally different than anything you, you've ever I uh, heard before, and it's, it's really more of a, a, a Jewish perspective as opposed to a Gentile perspective, because most people, when they teach, are going to teach that the unpardonable sin is just simply the rejection of, of the Messiah, as though it's an individual sin that a person could commit. And um, I don't think that's what's going on here at all. Let's look at it. The first thing is Jesus uh, accused them uh, based on whether they accepted or rejected him as a Messiah. He makes the accusation against them that they've committed the unpardonable sin. And of course, that uh, leads to the question and that you get on the call in radio shows all the time, I'm afraid I may have committed the unpardonable sin. And, uh, and certainly, the, the right answer there is that if you're afraid that you've committed it, one thing we know for sure, you haven't. But uh, uh, it, it goes, uh, uh, it's a little bit bigger than that. And I've got four just uh, points to go over with you, and I've actually got them on the Slide. The first thing is that the unpardonable sin is not an individual sin. It is a national sin committed by the national leaders who rejected Jesus by saying he was possessed by Satan himself. That's context. These are the national leaders representing the Sanhedrin. They've accused Jesus. They've rejected his messiahship. Therefore, they're rejecting the kingdom, the messianic kingdom that he's come to bring. Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. He's going to explain that through a few illustrations and so forth in a moment. But they have rejected him nationally. So the idea that a, a person could commit the unpardonable sin is, is not really... I understand that the, the application, but what it's saying, it, we're talking about a national sin. Again, so unless, um, unless you were Jewish and you were living in the first century and you were a part of the Sanhedrin and you were part of this decision-making on behalf of Israel... No, oh, Charlie here. I know Charlie's old, but he's not that old, you know. So there, there's nobody here that really has to, there he is. Nobody has to really worry about this. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? saying people that are concerned about this, it's great because it means they, they want to come to God. And they want to know if God will forgive them. And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, absolutely yes. The unpardonable sin is not an individual sin. It's a national sin committed by national leaders. Secondly, that generation of Jews were judged for this when, they, uh, when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD and they were dispersed to the whole world. God de did deal with them in terms of, of, uh, of judgment. And, and as we get to Matthew 24 and as we look at things historically, uh, the other things that we know is because Jesus warned believers that uh, when you see the temple mount, when you see Israel surrounded uh, and so forth, of course, Jesus was talking about what's going to be happening uh, in the tribulation period. But uh, again, prior to 70 AD, again, Titus and the Roman legions come and destroy in 70 AD. Prior to that, the, uh, is, the city had been surrounded. All the believers, all the Jewish believers that Jesus died for their sins that were there, they said, aha, this is what Jesus was talking about. And he says, when we see this, we better flee. Uh, and so what happened is that uh, the Romans ran out of supplies. They retreated to the Mediterranean to get resupplied. And as they did, every believer in Jesus fled across the Jordan River and fled into uh, present-day Jordan. And as far as we know, historically, from every writings that we have, no believers in Jesus were killed in the 70 AD judgment, but that generation was. Uh, and then those that survived were dispersed to the four corners of the world. All of that has everything to do with this idea of the unpardonable sin. Uh, three, the sin cannot be applied to other generations of Jews. As Jesus will make clear, it was for that generation only. And you'll begin to see him now several times saying, and that generation, and that wicked generation, and this generation. All of his teaching is going to change at this point. He's no longer going to do miracles to attest to his messiahship. 
He'll do miracles because he has compassion on people, and he'll heal a person. He'll do miracles with, the, with um, taking Peter, James, and John aside and then healing somebody because he's training them for what they're going to be doing uh, after his death and resurrection. But he's, he has done proving or authenticating his Messiahship. Everything will change, and you'll hear a lot of, a lot of his rebukes and admonishments to that generation or this generation. Uh, this does not apply to other generations uh, uh, of Jews. Fourth, the offering of the coming messianic kingdom is now rescinded, but will be offered in the future to another generation of Jews. And we know which one that is. It's going to be during the tribulation. Again, there's a, at the end of the tribulation, we know what brings Jesus Christ back to planet Earth is a remnant of, of Jews representing the nation will cry out and receive Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus will say t- uh, to them that he says, um, uh, I, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Until you recognize me as the Messiah uh, to the Jewish people as a nation, not individually, but as a nation, you will not see me again. And of course, we know that he does return for and then the offer of the kingdom comes and is received, and that's what takes us into the, the messianic kingdom. Uh, the bottom line then is that since this is, has to do with the nation, still individually, they would, we would, everyone today must decide to accept or reject Jesus uh, as the Messiah. And, you know, he doesn't uh, give us a, a lot of... A lot of uh, room here. He's, uh, you're, you're either gathering or you're scattering. You're either with me or, 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 or you're against me. Because it's our tendency to try to find neutral ground, to find middle ground. I know a number of years ago when uh, Kathy and I were still involved uh, uh, with the Pacific Handcrafters Guild and I ran a lot of their uh, screenings and everything for people that could be in the, uh, in the guild, we'd bring judges in from different people in the arts community and stuff and, and it was a, a blind juring system. And, and they had to score them based on originality and overall impression and, and uh, you know, craftsmanship ability and all these kind of things, uh, one to five. And then they had to hit a certain score in order to be able to accept it uh, into the guild. And what we found we had to do is say, one to five, the one score you couldn't give was a three. Because <laughs> everybody would have a tendency to be right in the middle. That's not really, we're just going to make a decision here. You can give them a one or two or a four or five. No threes are allowed. you got to make some kind of decision. It's good or it's not good. You know, we're giving you a little wiggle room with the points and stuff, but uh, uh, we had to make them make a decision. Uh, and Jesus does that with us. He forces us to make a decision. There's no middle ground. We either accept him uh, or we reject him. We're either for him uh, or we're against him. Uh, and again, that applies to us as individuals. Now, again, the idea of uh, the unpardonable sin was blasphemy, uh, blasphemy against the, the spirit. People are uh, concerned about this at times. And what's blasphemy? Well, they, again, they accuse Jesus of blasphemy because he claimed to be uh, God come in the flesh. And that's when they would take up stones and, and want to kill him. Uh, people commit this sin all the time today. Every time somebody cusses or uses the name of Jesus, they're, they're committing blasphemy. Any group or individual that denies the deity of Christ is committing blasphemy. They're denying who he is. Uh, Anyone that denies that uh, his shed blood is sufficient to forgive us of our sins, they're committing blasphemy. People commit blasphemy all the time, and and many of us did along the way. That certainly did not stop Jesus from forgiving us. And uh, one of the biggest blasphemers was a guy named Saul of Tarsus. He says in uh, 1 Timothy uh, one thirteen. Even though I was once a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance: Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, <coughs> of whom I am the worst. So, again, this idea of the unpardonable sin, and as though. Some person at a point in time could say something, do something, utter some phrase, and that somehow then they've crossed a line. And then, no matter what, in this age or the age to come, they could never be forgiven. Sometimes that's that's taught. 
Have you ever said anything against the Holy Spirit? Oh, I might have watched. You might have committed the unpardonable sin. You know, again, this, does that sound like what Jesus was all about in terms of trying to, he's just given this whole thing. If anyone would come to me and be yoked to me and learn of me and I'll give you rest. This is all in, all in that context. Uh, and, uh, and now he comes along and, uh, and, and basically, though they reject him nationally, and we're going to read in a moment, he's going to give another one of those whosoever phrases uh, that would come, and he would uh, forgive their sins. Uh, again, to clarify one thing in, some, in a phrase that uh, Paul uses here, when he says, I acted in ignorance. Uh, within Judaism in the Old Testament, uh, there were two kinds of people, those that acted and sinned in ignorance uh, and those that sinned willfully. The ones that could be forgiven were the ones that sinned in ignorance, but that needs to be defined. The ones that sinned in ignorance means <clears throat> that they sin, they recognize their sin, and so they brought the proper sacrifice so their sins could be forgiven. In other words, they repented. That's a person that sinned in ignorance. Paul's saying, I sinned in ignorance. <clears throat> I realize that Jesus is the Messiah. He died for my sins. I've changed my thinking. I've repented, and I've received forg my um, forgiveness of sins. To sin and not in ignorance or willfully means you know it, you refuse to repent, you go on your own way. And Paul, and, and there's no forgiveness for that. But, but anyone that would come, that's the implication of what Paul's saying here, but he's drawing from, again, a, an Old Testament word, is that anyone that would come and recognize their own sin and come to him, as Paul would write, you know, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's not easy. Jesus died for our sins, but it's, in a sense, that, that simple. The second thing about the accusation is the accusation of judgment is illustrated by Jesus in a tree and its fruit. Again, a, a good tree is recognized by its fruit, very simple. A bad tree recognized by its his, by his bad fruit. And he's talking to the Pharisees here uh, as well. And certainly we, uh, we would certainly understand the illustration is very simple. He's saying that what you say in a moment and what you do is an indication of what's, uh, what's in your heart. Uh, the accusation, thirdly, of the Jewish le leadership actually condemns uh, themselves. Jesus says the Jewish leadership is evil based on what they're saying about him. Then he uses this very complimentary term, calling them a brood of vipers. Uh, again, I'm, you know, I'm just kind of rolling through this, but I think there was people's voices were getting... Uh, raised here a, a little bit, including Jesus as, as, uh, as we're going through this. I mean, if we were to kind of act this thing out, I think Jesus is probably shouting in their face uh, at this point. And can you understand why? Because they have just rejected the offer of his kingdom. They just rejected on behalf of, of the nation who he was. God come in the flesh, born in a manger, lived a perfect sinless life, did everything the Messiah was supposed to be. And when you even shove it in my face and can you do this and heal this one guy that only a Messiah can do? Yes, I can even do that. Now what will you do? And the people say, isn't he the Messiah? And they say, no, he's doing this by the devil. And when he turns and says, you brood of vipers, he's, he gets a little heated. I don't think, you know, this is not Jesus meek and mild that sometimes... Uh, we see on the, the flannel boards in Sunday school. Uh, he's, he's very compassionate with, with anybody that would come to him with any kind of humility. I mean, think about Matthew, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, anybody, street people. But man, when it came to these religious leaders that were acting on behalf of the nation, he lays into them, and uh, this will not be the only time. He says they are incapable of saying anything good or, or true because man speaks from his heart. And, and then, uh, again, a very shocking statement that every man will have to give an account for every careless word spoken on the day of judgment. And again, that careless word is in context of saying spiritual things uh, that are not true or that are careless. And so uh, certainly we need to heed that and be careful as well. Let's go on to the fourth thing. Jesus will authenticate himself as a Messiah with one final sign. Verse 38, then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. 
For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at judgment with this generation and condemn it. Notice again the this generation. They repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise at judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now one greater than Solomon is here. Again, so the Jewish leadership asked for a miraculous proof again, and, uh, and he says that uh, none will be given except the sign of Jonah. Now somebody else kept asking for miraculous proofs as well. Can you turn these stones into bread? Will you jump off the temple? Satan kept asking for another miraculous sign as well. And, and that's where these guys are coming from. He says, there is so much evil in your heart, you're not even capable of saying anything uh, good or true because it's out of the heart that the mouth speaks. Uh, when it says uh, he answered, uh, we kind of miss a little bit in the NIV and uh, King James, New King James, better translation, uh, it'll say something like he answered and said. Now, it seems redundant, but it's there for a purpose because it means that he's saying this loudly and in public. In other words, when they, when they say, you know, will you give us another miraculous sign? He doesn't say, well, listen, you guys, I'm telling you for life. No, he, he lets them have it. He wants everybody to know what he's saying. He's kind of raising his voice. This is a very public uh, admonition that he's giving to them, referring to them as a wicked and adulterous generation. No other sign will be given. This is not the only time that they do this. Matthew 16, later, they come back, the same group of guys with the same idea. Matthew 16, 1 says, The Pharisees and now and the Sadducees uh, came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, When evening comes, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them uh, and went his way. Again, the sign of Jonah, the prophet, um, something they would be very familiar with. And of course, you know the story of Jonah swallowed by the huge fish uh, three days and three nights, and then he is extricated on the, uh, <laughs> the shoreline so that he can make his way to, uh, to, to Nineveh. So it's interesting, people can get caught up in this passage as to, well, uh, is it three literal days and three literal nights? And that's not even the point. Uh, the point is uh, Jesus will, will die and be buried and be raised again from the dead. That's the point. Was it on a Wednesday? What? That's not the point. The point is, Jesus is saying, there's only one more sign that's going to be given. It's going to be my death, and it's going to be my res resurrection. If you begin to examine the preaching early on in the book of Acts, that's what you're going to find. Death, burial, resurrection. Death, burial, resurrection. Even when Paul's preaching on uh, Mars Hill there at the area of Gopius, in Acts 17, um, he talks about the fact that um, he says, all men everywhere must repent. Uh, and he goes on to say, because uh, the man that God has chosen is going to judge. And he says, he's given proof of this by raising him from the dead. That is the proof. Why should you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, as your Messiah? Because he died and he rose again. That's it. And, uh, and that's the only proof. That's the one last sign he's going to uh, give to them and to that generation. It will be too late for them nationally, but certainly not, as we know from the book of Acts, uh, individually. But the Jewish leadership, secondly, refused to repent. Now, the men of Nineveh will stand in judgment against that generation. Again, it's interesting, Matthew, Jewish, writer, uh, Jewish readers, he keeps pulling in these Gentile examples, which probably irritated a few people. Uh, the Ninevites, of course, were one of the most hated society on the planet. They were one of the most cruel groups of people that ever lived, which is why Jonah didn't want to go up there to start with. Jonah's prophet from northern Israel going further north. His own family members more than likely had been butchered and brutalized by the Assyrians. And that's, he's got good reason. He doesn't want them to <laughs> repent. He wants God to bring judgment on them. That's why he doesn't want to go up there and give this message that's why we refer to him as a reluctant prophet. 
But can you imagine what Jesus is saying? That generation will, or the Ninevites will raise up at the end and judge that particular generation because they repented uh, and the people before Jesus uh, did not repent. Uh, he says that, uh, um, uh, and one greater than, uh, than Jonah is, is, uh, is now with them. And uh, Warren Wiersbe, I, I, I pulled several things from him that I thought were interesting. He says that uh, Jesus is greater in his person because Jonah was a mere man. He was greater in his obedience for Jonah disobeyed God and was chastised for it. Jesus arose from the dead under his own power, unlike uh, Jonah. Jonah ministered to only one city while Jesus gave his life for the whole world. Jesus is greater in his love. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of love with Jonah. Uh, Jonah's message saved Nineveh from judgment, uh, but after all, he was a messenger of, of wrath, where Jesus' message was one of grace and salvation, uh, and we are saved from judgment uh, by turning to him and receiving eternal life. Uh, and again, uh, you know, there, there is the application, and I understand of this idea of the unpardonable sin, is that uh, that is the rejection of Jesus as the Messiah, as our Savior, and, and certainly that's the only thing that would keep a person uh, out of heaven. The Queen of the South will rise up in judgment. Again, this is the Queen of Sheba, and you can read about her in the Old Testament. Heard about Solomon's wisdom, travels uh, all the way. Jesus says, again, one greater than Solomon in his wisdom uh, is with him now. And then finally, a couple things that, uh, again, on cursory reading would seem like they don't fit here, but they really do. Uh, the fifth thing is Jesus contrasts those who accept him with those who reject him as a Messiah. Verse 43, when an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I'll return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting him to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside waiting to speak to you. He replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. That's quite a contrast between those who now would individually, they've rejected him nationally, they, the offer of the Messianic kingdom has now been rescinded, but individually, and we have a whosoever, whosoever that would come to him would be accepted uh, versus those that would refuse and would be uh, rejected. And it's illustrated first, the final condition of that generation would be worse, illustrated in, in this person who's got an evil spirit in him. Now, we don't even know if the evil spirit is cast out or if the evil spirit leaves on its own accord. The, the text doesn't really say. Uh, the point is that it departs. Uh, and, uh, and goes out in an arid place and just finds no place to rest, decides it will come back. Now, when it comes back to this person, it's, it's found that it's been swept clean uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it begins to enter, enter with seven others. The last condition is worse than the first. That's the nation of Israel. God sends the prophets. He sends John the Baptist. And John the Baptist preaches the message of the coming kingdom, the coming Messiah. They needed to repent and sweep the house clean to prepare themselves. John did that. Many of the people did that. But instead of receiving the Messiah, they reject him. So their last condition is going to be worse than the first. That's the illustration of, of the rejection. Uh, and, and certainly uh, it is. During the time uh, of Jesus, during the time of John, they're under Roman rule. They're paying tribute to Rome, uh, and that certainly is not a good thing. Uh, but at the same time, they're still living under, uh, the temple is there, sacrifices are continuing, they're ruled at least religiously by the Sanhedrin and so forth, but their last condition is worse because the temple is totally destroyed, a million plus people are killed by the Romans, those that survive are sold into slavery throughout Rome and they're dispersed uh, throughout the, the entire world. Because of the rejection, 
the last condition is worse than it was before. But notice that, the, again, the illustration that Matthew brings in, and why does he tell us this story in all of this context about uh, mom, uh, you know, showing up with uh, his brothers and, uh, and sisters, and uh, be, they're probably more than a little concerned, and they've heard what's going on, and there's a lot of drama happening and so forth. And we know that, at least in terms of his brother's, uh, they did not really uh, receive and believe him as a Messiah until after his death and resurrection. So they show up uh, and they want to see him. And Jesus says a very interesting thing here. He says, is that who are my brothers and who is my mother? And who are my sisters? It's the ones who do the will of my father. What is the will of the father to receive Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior? And those that accept him and do that, Jesus says to you, to I, you are my mother, you are my brothers, you are my sisters. That's quite a contrast in, in what's happening with a condition that's worse than, than, uh, than it was before and it was already bad versus what would happen if we would now at least individually receive him uh, as our Lord and Savior. Uh, you know, in a way, I know I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know already, but it's just important to kind of get the, uh, the theology uh, down here and understand so that we're not confused and maybe we can help other people that deal with this issue wouldn't it be a horrible thing for someone that, that wanted to come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and they think they've committed some sin that he would not forgive? They, you talk about a, a, a tragedy. I, I grew up in a church where, where there were people that uh, would come but feel like they could never come forward at the altar and give their life to Christ because they couldn't quit smoking. Like that had something to do with it. Uh, or they couldn't stop. As though they had to do something in order to qualify <laughs> to be able to come forward to give their life to the Lord, like they had to clean their, their act up. Uh, what, a, what a tragedy uh, when the offer is there for, for anyone and everyone, and it doesn't matter who you are or, or what you've done. This helps us understand something else as well. Think about later after this, and we'll get to it. Jesus is riding in and what we call Palm Sunday. But again, he's writing into Jerusalem on the exact day that, that Daniel said he would ride in. From the, Daniel said from the time uh, that the, you have the rebuilding uh, of the walls with a trench around Jerusalem to the time of the Messiah would be 173,880 days. Don't ask me to break it down with the dates, but that's what Daniel said, uh, basically. And on that day, and Jesus said, if you'd only known this day, but what do the people do? They, they do the palm branches and stuff, which was, they did that because uh, the, they were hailing him as the Messiah. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The people do receive him. The people receive him as the Messiah that day, right? Uh, what is Jesus' response? Do you remember? He weeps because the unpardonable sin has already been committed. Nationally, they've already rejected him. It happens right here in Matthew 12. He knows what is going to happen. He, know, he not only knows what's going to happen to him in three days, uh, he knows what's going to happen in 70 AD. And he knows what history is going to be played out. And, uh, and yet he rides in that day, weeps over the people, weeps over the city, and then later from the Mount of Olives looking back, says, you won't see me again as your Messiah until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Redemption, the history of redemption kind of pivots on, on this text. We're going to see his teaching change. We're going to see the miracles change. We're going to see a lot more parables because he's going to teach in parables and people are going to go, uh, did you get that? No, I don't think I got that. And then, and then his own disciples are going to be going, uh, could you kind of repeat that again? And he's going to explain to them privately. It's going to be all about getting those guys ready for his death and his resurrection and the ministry that he would have for them and taking the gospel to, uh, to all the earth. But it all, it all hinges and it all, all turns uh, right, right here. But uh, I just encourage you to tell others there is no sin that you've ever committed or ever will commit that Jesus Christ will not forgive. Paul says, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And... Um, there's a few of us that can say hallelujah to that as well. Amen. Everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Let everything that, everything that.
that everything that has breath praise the lord let everything that everything that everything that has breath praise the lord let everything that everything that everything that has breath praise the lord let everything that everything that everything that has breath praise the
Covered by grace, covered by life, covered by the fullness of you, covered by strength, covered by love, covered by the fullness of you. I will. that together. I will wait. I will wait for you. Watch. Watch and wait for you. I'm gonna walk. 